Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will talk about how to use basic trigonometric functions to control the position of our geometry. First, I will show you how to basically arrange points using sine and cosine inside of attribute valves of Houdini. And then we will jump into Unreal Engine where I will show you how we can control, for example, some materials emission color. In our case, using the same function, but it will be based on time. Before we begin, I just want to say that the videos are free for your use and they will remain free forever. However, if you want to support the channel and get the asset files at the same time, please consider joining the Patreon. Or if you're not a fan of subscriptions, you can get the files on my Gumroad page. Links in the descriptions and the comments below. So let's begin. First, let's create the grid. It's basically most obvious way to create points in Houdini. And then we scatter them. And for now, let's just say 1000 points will be fine. So now what we're going to do is drop an attribute map, go inside and see what we can do with our geometry. So first things first, we will actually be trying to work with point number. And don't be confused with number of points, because number of points is just the total number of points, which is 1000. And point number is, well, basically the number of points, if you can see that each point has a number and we can basically work with it. What we're going to do is drop the vector to float, press enter, and here we go. So basically we divided the position into vector and we can work with each of the axis as if it was a float. By the way, if you're a bit confused what's going on, please check out my playlist on getting started with Houdini and getting started with attributes and vops. So this makes sense for you. It's on my channel, so it's really easy to find. What we're gonna do next is start dropping our trigonometry functions. So first we have the sign, and if we get the point number into the sign, which is basically the radians, and radians is another way of representing an angle, and if we now get the float to vector and start, let's say, connecting y to y, z to z, and the x will be the sign of the point number, we will see that, uh, well, Something is definitely going on. Not really sure what's what, right? So next, let's drop the cosine. And again, we get the point number and we connect that to the Z axis. And as you can see, magically, almost magically, I would say, because obviously we do it by hand, no magic here. The points begin arranging themselves in a perfect circle. And as you can see, if we decrease the number of points, something like this, we can see that we indeed have all our points arranged. However, they're kind of stuck on top of each other, or should I say they're not on top of each other, they're stuck on the y-axis, as y-axis being the zero. However, we can make it more interesting if we start controlling the position of the y of our points as well. So what we're gonna do, again, we will use the point number to dictate the position in the y-axis. And it's actually, Super useful for geometry arrangement in our case. Uh, you will see in the second why. So first we get the, well, basically we can do, do the point number and put it directly into the y axis and you will see, well, something is going on. Definitely we can see this helix kind of thing. However, right now there is a little bit of a problem. One, it's being the point number is, as you can see, the PT num is int, which means it's an integer. It's not a float. And second, uh, well, we don't have actually like explicit control of where the points go. They just, you know, uh, point number zero goes to, well, the floor, which is zero. Point number one goes to one in the y-axis. Point number two goes to in the two in the y-axis and so forth. We can actually check it out in the geometry spreadsheet. And as you can see, the point number zero gets the position in y, zero. And 29, 29, as you can see, well, that, that's what it says. So what we're gonna do, is multiply the constants. Uh, basically, we get the point number. We multiply it, let's say, by 0.1, right? And we get it into the y-axis. But another problem appears is that you can see that if I disable it, we can see that it's kind of like jumps, like stairs, like this. If I uh, maybe increase the number of points and multiply it like this, you will see that it kind of jumps like from zero to one to two to three and so forth. So this happens because this is an integer and we need a float. Uh, well, basically a number has decimal points like here, zero, zero, one, four, seven. All we're gonna do is integer to float 
And if we convert this integer to float from blue to the teal, you will see that it fixes the thing. And well, it does what it says. Let's go back and reduce the number of points. Let's say 24. Doesn't really matter at this point. We multiply it like uh, 0 0.2, for example. And as we can see, we have some arrangement, but it's kind of hard to see right now. So what we're going to do is we will add, go to the polygons by group, and lo and behold, we have the thing that we want. So now what we're going to do, we can sweep, get the round tube, maybe decrease the radius a little bit. Let's say single polygon ends do not stretch around corners. And if we subdivide that, you'll see that we indeed start to have some helix. Of course, we can control it if we tweak the multiplier like this. Let's get back, copy and transform, rotate it by 180. And we finally have the perfect double helix that we wanted to do. By the way, if you wanted to animate from top to bottom or back again, we can add the carve node right after we edit and we work with curves and we can just now carve the curves as you can see. Actually, let's enable that. As you can see, we can smoothly go from up and down or from top to bottom, whichever you want. And basically what it does is that we can start animating it without being dependent on the topology because, well, as you can see, we have not a lot of points. There is, if I make the point marker size like eight, you will see that we indeed have not a lot of points, but again, carves allows us to smoothly go and to tweak the cutoff of our geometry that is not being dependent on the actual topology, which is super useful in our case. And of course, it helps us to create this double helix. And of course, if you apply the things that we learned in the attribute maps, you will see that we can use that to create an actual double helix geometry that you can see in this animation here. So that is how you can arrange the geometry and points based on these uh, sine and cosine function. However, we can also use it to control, for example, materials. And in our case, we will jump right into Unreal Engine to see how we do that. All right, so here we are in Unreal Engine. You can see I have a sphere. Well, nothing spectacular here. And just uh, right-click material, created the sys sign lerp material, which again has nothing. So what we're going to do now is we will actually see how we can use sign based on time. Now, what we need is, if you guessed it right, the sign function and, of course, the time function. So if we connect time to sign, and I'll just right click and start previewing this node. You will see it goes from black to white. And it, if I make it real time, it will actually look better. As you know, it goes from negative one to one. And we can use that in our case. For example, let's connect it to the emissive color. Let's stop previewing this node, press save. And you will see that indeed it changes the color. However, first of all, it changes the color a little bit too fast for my liking. So what we're going to do is multiply the time by, let's say, 0 0.3 to make it slower. And as you can see, it does, well, what it has to do, right? So it goes to black to white. However, as you can see, it spends a little bit too much time in the black state, much longer than it spends in the white state. And this happens because you can see that sine function, it goes from 1 to 0, then it goes to negative one and goes back to zero. What we want is for it to go from zero to one to zero to one. So basically we need to tweak it so it spends the same amount of time being black and white. In our case, white is one and black is zero. So anything below zero will remain black because it's emissive color. If it's, well, basically negative emitting color, it doesn't emit anything and well, stays black. So long story short, so what we're going to do is add one to our sign. So now what happens is our sign goes from zero. It goes from zero to two, to zero to two. And well, that's forever like that. Let's see if we save that, you will see that it now glows a little bit brighter. However, what I really want to do is make it go from zero to one. Since we added one, 
we can now multiply it by 0 0.5 whoops 0 0.5 and now it finally goes from 0 to 1 and back again and that's just exactly what we want so now it's maybe not so super interesting but what we can do is use this as a mask for our linear interpolation so i hold down the l key left click you can see we have lerp i get it lerp to the alpha and i connect this to emissive color and you will see that well basically nothing changes because all we do is we interpolate from zero to one and back again using the sign function that we have we can make it a little bit more interesting make it like a diffuse color one diffuse color two go make this this kind of like violet color make this maybe a little bit like cyberpunk green and if we now connect the color one and color two in the lerp and we save it we will see that it goes from violet to green and changes it smoothly and over time so this right here is how we can use the sine function Again, you can basically edit this to make it kind of like the color of danger. For example, we'll make it super red, go from this red to almost black. And if you place a couple of lamps like that in a, I don't know, sci-fi corridor, you'll have horror illumination. Obviously, we have this emissive color here, so it will emit and illuminate the scene around it. So as you can see, the trigonometric functions can be super useful for your 3D art. And you cannot just control the spatial arrangement of things like we did in Houdini, but you can also control, for example, the materials real time based on time in Unreal Engine or any other application that you personally use to create your art. So there is that. Go have fun with your newly acquired knowledge. I hope you had fun and learned something. And if you want to learn more about using math for 3D art, you can definitely check out the, all of the other videos in the playlist and subscribe to the channel. And I hope to see you in the next videos. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day and bye-bye.